thank you. And now, what's your list, my brothers? We'll be talking about on the privacy and security of the ultrasound ecosystem. Hello, thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, today I'm presenting the, on the privacy and security of the ultrasound ecosystem. I'll start with a short story of a product and framework. Better now? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. Um, okay, I'll just run it. Yes. I mean, can't go any closer. Okay, thanks. Awesome, thank you. Um, okay, so this is a story of a product first. Uh, in 2012, Silver Push, a company was uh, um, founded in India, and they had uh, this product uh, on uh, ultrasound tracking, uh, which was uh, basically an ultrasound tracking framework. 2014, they got some uh, funding from uh, venture capitals, and uh, then uh, following up from this, there were popular, uh, popular press articles uh, discussing their technology and uh, the merits of it and how cool it is. And then shortly after, like a year and a half, um, the security community took notice of it and things were not that nice anymore. Uh, so this is the first email, at least this was uh, the first trace of uh, the security community um, realizing what happened that I was able to find. So this is a, on, a, uh, on a W3C um, mailing list and basically what they're saying is that, you know, there is this tracking framework using ultrasounds. Um, yeah, it looks shady and uh, there are potentially transparency and privacy issues. But uh, from the email, I, could, I mean, there were not technical details at the time. So following up from that, popular press articles basically picked, picked up on it and came up with fancy headlines. And um, following up those uh, um, articles, like f about four months, five months after the FTC uh, takes action and sends uh, this letter to everyone, all the developers on the Google App Store who are using that framework, basically tells them, you know, if uh, permissions are not enough, if you are tracking your users, you should basically let them know um, what is it that you are tracking for and what you are doing. So you have to be explicit. Um, so following up on this, Silver Push withdraws from the US market and says, you know, we're not cooperating with anyone in the US. Uh, this doesn't affect us. Uh, and everyone then was very happy, press moved on, uh, it wasn't hot anymore, I guess. People went quiet because, yeah, the, the evil company was not around anymore. And they, it was mainly treated as an isolated incident. So um, the problem with that was that very few things became known about the technology itself. So, and we had lots of questions. Some of them were like, um, okay, what are they using ultrasounds for? Because at the time we just knew they were using ultrasounds, but we had no idea what these frameworks are doing with these kind of things. Uh, also, we were not sure if that was the only product using ultrasounds in the market. Uh, it was likely that there were other products as well. And then, of course, it looked kind of, uh, it was scaring the sense of security and privacy. So we wanted to see, uh, to learn more about it. So this is who we are. Uh, I am Vasilis, uh, worked with Christopher Krugel, uh, Swan Hao, um, uh, Giovanni Vigna, uh, Yannick Fratantoni, and Federico Maggio on it. Um, I will start with cross-device tracking, which is uh, related to the actual technology. Um, so cross-device tracking is basically what marketers and advertisers are all about right now. Their main problem is that users now have lots of devices and to them, you appear as a different person from each different device. So what they want to do is basically to link all those devices together so that they know that it's the same person and then they can follow up on you with their ads and content everywhere. Um, there are two main ways to do that, either deterministic or probabilistically. Um, the deterministic is very simple. If you are Facebook or Google, people are heavily incentivized to log in from all, your device, from all their devices to your service. So then it's trivial for you to know it's the same person. But if you're not Google or Facebook, then it's a tough, um, tough thing to do. So they came up with different ways to do it, and this is the uh, probabilistic um, approach. So one of those approaches uses uh, ultrasound beacons. So ultrasound beacons are not really, a f it's a, just a fancy name for a simple idea. So basically, there are like high-frequency audio tags 
um, and they lie at the core of all ultrasound enabled products. Um, they encode a small uh, sequence of symbols and the cool thing about them is that they are inaudible to humans and they can be emitted and captured by all uh, speakers and uh, microphones in commercial devices. So no special equipment is needed. Um, here are mo some more technical details. What they do is they operate on the spectrum between 18 kilohertz and uh, 20 kilohertz, and they divide the spectrum into smaller chunks, uh, which allows them to co then correspond each chunk to a, a character so that they can build up their unique audio tags. And that's basically it. Each company does it differently uh, because there, there is no ultrasound standard uh, at the time. And um, of course, there are lots of patents, patents trying to companies try to exclude competitors from doing similar things. Um, there are smarter ways to encode. Companies start to move towards these ways, but this is like, uh, if you're using audio tags simply, um, this is the main thing that they are doing. So then combining those two things, cross-device tracking and ultrasound beacons, you can do ultrasound cross-device tracking, which basically offers very high accuracy, even though uh, users don't log in to their devices because you're not Facebook. Um, and then you can em embed uh, those beacons to content, either on TV, radio, or websites. And uh, given a framework installed on a um, user's uh, smartphone, for instance, you can pick up those uh, beacons and then you can trace the content, the content they're listening to and potentially the devices coming from. So this sounds like a strong assumption, but what we saw is basically uh, you can do this through loyalty apps, like a supermarket app or a concert app listening for ultrasounds, by the way, or through advertising SDKs that a completely unrelated application, um, the developer just adds this advertising SDK on his app just to earn a, a small revenue. And by the way, it also listens for ultrasounds on the background. So here's how it works. Um, it's really not that complicated. Um, the, the, the company who wants to get advertised goes to one of those providers. And um, the providers basically uh, start a new campaign. They generate a few beacons associated with it. And then they start embedding those beacons to actual content. Um, and when the user accesses this content uh, from the speakers of, the, of the, his device, uh, the ultrasound beacon gets emitted. So what happens next is that basically if he has a smartphone nearby, like up to seven meters, it still works. Um, the beacon is going to get picked up and then reported on the background to the, uh, the servers of the company, which now knows that all oh, that user wants um, this content. So then they can follow up with him, uh, basically update his uh, interest profile and push relevant ads with the final goal to increase their conversion rate. Um, so this is only one use case for ultrasounds in the, that we've seen on the market now. There are many others, like uh, audience analytics, uh, synchronized content and proximity marketing and device pairing, which, is, which was used also on Chromecast. Um, so we have seen all those things, and then we started wondering if this is secure, and because it looks shady. You can do all those things, but is it really um, secure? So I, start, uh, I, I will demonstrate uh, one of the attacks we came up with. So we just need the user with a computer with speakers and the Tor browser, and um, a smartphone which listens for ultrasound. In a state level adversary, I'm gonna say a bit more about this later. So let's assume the following scenario. So there is a whistleblower who wants to leak a document and conducts actually a journalist that um, he is willing to share it with. Um, and then the journalist is trying to de-anonymize him. And for that reason, he asks him to go to a Tor hidden service and upload the document there. The whistleblower does that and let's see what happens. So the whistleblower opens the Tor browser, and he has his phone nearby. Now we put it really nearby so that it's on the frame, but it can be in a larger distance. Uh, in this, for the demo, we made it super obvious that the phone is listening for ultrasounds. Otherwise, it, normally it happens on the background. You can't see anything. So now the phone starts listening, and the whistleblower opens up um, a benign looking website. And then it's not so benign anymore. So it updates itself to include some data. 
Okay, so I'm not sure how obvious it is, but um, he has like the phone number, IP address. This is the location, this is our lab at UCL. Um, MAC address, uh, I email, and the, um, the, Google, the Gmail is basically the uh, Android account I used uh, for that, uh, that particular experiment. So he has lots of information. Essentially, um, um, the whistleblower got de-anonymized. So here's how, here's how we did it. Um, we started the campaign, and then we embedded the um, beacon in, the, in um, a Tor hidden service which, which we set up. And we asked the whistleblower to visit that Tor hidden service. And then once the hidden service was loaded, um, the, the laptop that we used basically emitted ultrasounds. This we couldn't hear at all. Um, but the phone picked it up and reported back to the um, actual tracking provider where this, a state level adversary uh, can subpoena and get the data from. Um, so as I said previously, the state level adversary is a uh, we didn't have a state level adversary handy. So what we did is basically we simulated one, essentially redirecting those data straight to the, um, to the website it came from. And this is not a strong assumption to make because we've seen in the past this actually happening with, the, for instance, the at t example. So what happened in this case, there was um, uh, the at t set up a platform for governments to use and uh, they could just uh, uh, provide an administrative subpoena which doesn't require a judge order or anything. And then they were getting data super easily as long as they paid the fee the uh, at and uh, asked for. So okay, we solved these problems and then we wanted to do a security evaluation of that thing to see what's wrong with it. Um, first thing we noticed is that the threat model relies a lot on the fact that ultrasounds cannot go through walls and they have a limited range. And that's okay as long as you cannot use um, websites to emit ultrasounds or replay them from through different uh, platforms. So then the thread model is uh, not valid anymore. Um, another problem is that there, are, there is a huge lack of uh, authentication and encryption capabilities. The problem is that because of the, uh, the encoding, encoding they use, there is no space for crypto there. It happens in noisy environments. Uh, it, has, uh, it has low bandwidth, so you cannot really add crypto unless you do it in a smarter way. Uh, so this leaves them prone to replay and injection attacks. Um, the other problem is the uh, violation of the principle of least privilege. So what happens is basically if you want to listen for ultrasounds from a smartphone, you need full access to the microphone. And this is very bad because, of course, you can eavesdrop on users if you're a malicious developer. Or alternatively, if you're not, uh, you, you're not a malicious developer, you can be perceived by the users as one because the users are always suspicious of these kind of things. And this combined with a lack of transparency, um, meaning that lots of apps didn't do a good job in informing the, um, the user what they were actually doing or didn't tell them anything at all. So the, here is what happens when you do that. So in May 2016, an NBA sports team started using ultrasounds on their app and then they got, uh, there was a lawsuit and complaints from people. And then same thing in July uh, from another company. And then a few months after, again, there is a lawsuit against them. Um, so having seen all those things, we started wondering um, if we could somehow fix it. And first, our first response was that no, we can't. And uh, we were not particularly excited to try to fix the ecosystem. But then we started uh, thinking of solutions. So the first thing we did is basically an Android uh, uh, patch for the, the permission system. It basically creates a separation of uh, the permission to access the microphone for audible frequencies and to access the microphone for uh, ultrasound frequencies. So at least we solved uh, that way the problem of um, uh, being able to eavesdrop when you listen for ultrasounds. And then there, we also developed a browser extension which essentially filters out the range of frequencies that um, ultrasound beacons use and leaves all the other audio intact. And because this is a, a, an on the inaudible spectrum, there is no impact on the user experience. And you can do this on HTML5, it's actually pretty neat. Uh, and then we started discussing about long-term solutions. So standardization seems like a nice thing to do here. Um, if, we, if we can agree on an ultrasound beacon format and then def clearly define what the security features needed, um, we can actually uh, then proceed and have operating systems providing uh, methods for ultrasound beacon discovery, uh, emission generation, and everything, uh, much like uh, it happens with Bluetooth right now. 
So then you won't need access to the, um, to the actual microphone, and this solves the problem of ultrasound privileged apps. You just need access to that API as, as it happens with Bluetooth. Um, and then it, this solves, of course, the problem of being perceived as malicious or being malicious. Um, then there was another problem with microphone locking because, of course, if the framework is listening through the ultrasound, your camera cannot capture a video with, uh, uh, with audio at the same time. So the interesting thing is that it's, uh, since we published the paper, the Google, Google Nearby started um, um, taking off. So they actually used that um, um, to implement more or less what we discussed previously, although there is no ultrasound beacon standard yet. Um, Google Nearby is using also Bluetooth, but they also use ultrasounds, as seen here. So it's more or less that. And if you have, I think, Marshmallow 601, it should be on your settings, so you can check it out. Uh, I think it's off by default. And uh, basically, that's it. Uh, we have some lessons that we learned through this process. Essentially, um, it's nice to, and good to inform the users. Um, so be transparent. Uh, ask them if they want, uh, if you are about to take an action, you should ask them. And some apps do that. Most of them don't. Um, and then it's nice to have an opt-out option or pre uh, preferably an opt-in option somewhere in your app uh, in a visible place so that the users can uh, flip this on or off it, uh, if they decide to. And then finally, the standards in this case are very useful for security and, and uh, privacy. So that's about it. Thank you.